Harriet Elizabeth Prescott Spofford was born on April 3, 1835, and died on August 14, 1921. She was born in Calais, Maine, and attended Pinkerton Academy in Derry, New Hampshire for a few years, which is a school still active today. Hmm. After graduating at 17, she was forced into the role of caretaker of her father when he was stricken by paralysis and had to be the breadwinner of the family and turned towards writing. Her first story, In a Cellar, was published in The Atlantic in 1859, and her first novel, Sir Rohan's Ghost, followed in the same year. She married Richard S. Spofford in 1865, who died in 1888, and she wrote extensively for pretty much her entire life, largely gothic tangent tales. This was in the science fiction by Gaslight anthology that was put together and edited by Sam Moskowitz. And he said, quote, she was considered at least important enough to be praised by William Dean Howells and damned by Henry James. And personally, I can't stand Henry James. And yeah. I think William Dean Howells is just okay. So that's all right with me. Yeah, Henry James got into a famous feud with H.G. Wells as well. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. A lot of people really like Henry James and... I mean, Turn of the Screw is pretty cool. I guess. Exactly, yeah. On paper, Turn of the Screw seems like it would be something I would love, but I, uh, yeah, I just... It was okay for me, and I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's not really probably what he would like to be most known for. Either. No, no. But Spofford's most probably known for today for her story Moonstone Mass from 1868, which we'll be covering in a future episode. Seems very strange, almost proto-weird fiction in a way. This one, Ray of Displacement, is much later, from 1903, and was published in the Metropolitan Magazine. In it, the narrator invents a Y-ray, because at the time, X-ray had already been taken. This increases the space of atoms from one another, allowing objects to easily pass through. And while the narrator is tinkering around with his devices, this man named Brant stops in to ask about the narrator's experiments. This guy is like a judge of some kind, and he can pull some strings, and I guess he knows this scientist. So it's like kind of a hint that the two of them are were sort of in something together, maybe? Uh, that his wife was probably poisoned? It's weird. This is a weird story because a lot of stuff is implied but not really stated. Right, right. Just continue, and I'll, I'll make I'll try and make comments after. This was a really interesting one. Uh, yeah, it was. I agree. One day, Brant comes in with this huge diamond and places it on this polarized shelf, which vaporizes it. The diamond is gone, and Brant thinks it's some kind of practical joke and starts threatening the narrator and starts saying he's going to call the police. And the narrator turns on the Y-ray and charges himself. And yeah. the police come in and take the narrator down to the station. And he's able to walk right through the stone wall of the jail while still charged by this Y-ray. And he goes home and now sees the diamond is there. And he takes the diamond to Brant's house, unseen, because he can pass through walls. It's, I'd imagine, a relatively convenient thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. he puts it in one of his pockets. But he's still sentenced to prison for this diamond theft. And Brant has no intention of revealing the truth that the diamond has been returned to him. And the narrator tries to commit suicide, but fails and wakes up in a hospital instead, visited by Saint Angel, to who he demonstrates his ability to walk through walls, but says that what he really needs is to be vindicated of yeah. this crime and have his name cleared. And Saint Angel is a prison chaplain. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he's kind of like 
says that he's looking out for the narrator's soul in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's very clear with the name as to uh, what's going yeah. on here. <laughs> um, the narrator exchanges clothes with Saint Angel so he can freely leave for a few hours. He continues his research and discovers more about this molecular displacement phenomena and discovers the possibility that an object can be manipulated remotely. And he thinks of the various possibilities of this. And Saint Angel comes in then and says he's been pardoned by the governor after Saint Angel had argued his case in front of him. So they go back to his apartment and the narrator turns both of them invisible. And they go to the horse races and they see Brant there, who is betting huge sums of money. And they help the rider, who isn't the jockey that Brant is betting on to win, causing him to lose a lot of money. The narrator just places a wafer down Brant's back. And St. Angel tells him that they should do something better with their time than playing practical jokes and getting revenge on Brant. But the narrator wants to continue this harassment campaign. So they make Brant invisible without his knowledge, and he's unable to hail a cab. He hears these two Kings County officers talking negatively about him. And at this point, he rematerializes right in front of them and <laughs> kind of ruins their fun. Yeah. <laughs> so St. Angel gets really tired of this. Brant goes down and sits on him, and the narrator can't find St. Angel. And he thinks he might have got absorbed into Brant. And the narrator is pretty upset at this. And he goes back to his apartment and destroys all of his scientific instruments and wants to go back to prison for what he's done. And Brant unexpectedly comes in and goes to make things right with the diamond and everything else. And the narrator tells him, if I did not know who and what you are, I should think the soul of St. Angel had possession of you. So they go to make things right with the governor and realizes that St. Angel did indeed become a part of him. There's actually a very coherent and agonistic and well-drawn struggle in that scene between St. Angel and Brent. And it's like they are merging into one another. Yeah. And the way that it's depicted in the story is like, it's very extreme. Like, it's it's very blatant and extremely traumatic for the scientist to observe. I don't think he's ever given a name. No, I guess he's not, no. So it's very, it's very traumatic for him to observe. Yeah. Because Angel appears to sit down, but then it's like Brent is sitting down on top of him. Yeah, right, exactly. He doesn't like realize that him. Angel is yeah. there. Yeah, And he even talks to the scientist. Angel talks to the scientist the scientist is like, you know, you must struggle. You must get, you must get free of this. And Angel's like, no, it's too much. I can't. And it's, it was actually to me that was like the most painful part of the story. Like that was yeah. the most. Oh shit! Like now these two beings are in the same. They're trying to occupy the same space at the same time, yeah. and they can't. Yeah. So they're like struggling with one another. Yeah. And the thing is, one of them is a superior specimen physically, but the other is a superior mental specimen. Right. And that is the cool thing about the way they merge together. Yeah, they're combined. And in the end, it's a very positive thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I definitely like this one. Yeah, the scientist said he was trying to, he, he almost could see St. Angel in Brent, and yeah. obviously his personality was so changed. Yeah. I guess that was the end? That, I, that, I think so, yeah. How it ended? yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, nothing else really happened, but I guess the implication was that Brent was a changed man now. Right. Because he was obviously a very horrible person, right? Right. And now he has the personality of St. Angel in him. Yeah, who is like this beautiful, awesome person. Yeah, <laughs> right. The, the, the chaplain of the prison who looks after the souls of the condemned. Yeah. To me, this was very, very gothic. This was... Absolutely, yeah. That had yeah. all the gothic trappings yeah. The science fiction element was a little hard to understand. Like, I didn't quite see... I'm not sure that I 100% understood how the ray of displacement was supposed to work. No, it's guess, all clear guess, pseudoscience. Right, uh, right. I mean... But I mean... I guess if you were charged with a Y-ray, then you became... Yeah. Like... That, that seems more or less it. Yeah, you can walk through walls, and I guess it could also make you invisible, because, you know, why not? Right, right. And, and that could be objects or people. 
Right. So in the beginning, it's the diamond. Yeah. And and then it is, and there's there's no apparent ill effects of being exposed to this Y ray. Yeah. So we we would see that later in much movie and literary fiction, but especially I think movies of the 1950s where there's like scientists experimenting with stuff like this that would, yeah, like the, the, the uh, ray that would change their physical makeup make them impervious to whatever or be able to pass through objects solid apparently solid objects and it usually had some kind of negative consequence but yeah. here i think it's a very personal spiritual journey and i think that the scientist sees saint angel become sort of subsumed by the great physicality of brent but at the same time saint angel is so much more of a solid emotional spiritual person that even if physically he is subsumed, his mental clarity and the truth of his sulfur persona is able to dominate. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the body and the spirit as two different forces, mm -hmm. St. Angel is clearly more in touch with the spiritual side of things than Brant, who is totally immoral and petty in a way that the narrator is. I mean, the narrator yeah. doesn't seem like a good person. And St. Angel points out several times yeah. that he feels like the narrator's quest is pointless. Yeah. He goes along with them anyway, though, well, I guess because he just cares that much. Yeah, I, I think St. Angel wants to save everybody. And in a yeah. way, he saved Brant. And probably by oh, seeing definitely. Brant saved, the narrator feels saved. Yeah. And there was an interesting way that this story was written. It felt very sparse. Like, it felt... It felt like a lot was gone over, like glossed over almost very quickly. Mm -hmm. It was strange. Like, it was a well-written story. Uh, I'm not going to say that it felt rushed, like where the air quivered. But yeah. at the same time, it was like, I don't know, it felt compressed. Like, it felt like there was so much existential trauma compressed into just so few pages I liked that a lot of it was implied rather than outright stated. But it did lead to this kind of feeling of dislocation sometimes. Like, it was hard to keep track of what was going on with it. Like, it just seemed to jump from one thing to another. Yeah, and right, right. I don't know. It was it was very interesting, though. It was very interesting style of writing. She has a good prose style. And I would certainly like to read some of her gothic fiction. Yeah, I feel like she would have been really good at that. Because it seems at this point she was quite experienced. I mean, this is like 50 years into her career or right. something like that. Yeah, and we're definitely covering some people with a pretty long literary career tonight. Yeah. But she seems to have had probably the longest. Yeah, I don't think she wrote quite 300 novels like our previous no, author. No, like not necessarily in terms of prolificness, but yeah. longevity, yeah. perhaps. And she was certainly popular enough where she was profiled in a couple biographical pieces during this time. I drew on a piece written, I think, the 1880s about her for some biographical information. Yeah. So definitely was a recognized name during her day. It was strange, though. I mean, our scientist narrator, like, he was in prison for a really long time. Yeah. And he just sort of put up with it. Yeah, right. <laughs> he had the power to leave at any time. Like, even though he could pass through walls and everything. Yeah. Like, it, it was very strange to me. Like, it's yeah. hard to encompass the mental faculties of these people. Right. Especially when you contrast the fact that he goes on this, like, austere imprisonment on basic principle. You know, he feels like right. he's sinned against society he feels like he's done wrong so he's going to voluntarily stay in prison but yet when he gets out he spends his time just like harassing his, <laughs> his enemy like he doesn't do anything with his time that's productive he's it just feel uh kind of i don't know yeah i mean i have a weird thing about revenge stories like i I'm to the point now where I feel like revenge stories are really played out and like boring, right. but at this but at the same time I realize that a lot of my favorite fiction is actually revenge stories. Yeah. I can't really explain that. It's like, I don't want to see another revenge story, but at the same time, The Count of Monte Cristo and Jack Vance's The Demon Princes and The Star is My Destination and, I don't know, some movies that are, whose names escape me at the moment, but they're that are definitely ones that I like. Yeah. Like, they all sort of partake in this narrative, and I can't really explain 
why it's the most tired trope that I don't like, but at the same time, I like a lot of the stories that have that kind of motif. Right. And it seems like Spofford, like, there is that. But if there were, if we saw other perspectives, like, again, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this story is too short, too. It's strange. I can't decide whether I like the fact that the story is so sparse and it's so, yeah. like, or not. I can't decide whether I think it's a strength or a not strength. The plot know? is kind of jumbled in this one, but I like her pro style, so I guess it really didn't matter too, too much for me. Yeah. But I think she could have done more with this. And I think this is some of her only science fiction. Like, I mean, I Moonstone Mass, I think, is more like weird Arctic stuff. And I don't know how much explicit Yeah, I have, I'm not science. familiar with anything else by her. This is my first yeah. exposure to uh, Spofford. This is definitely a engineer developing gadgets and devices that do futuristic cool stuff. Cool things. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, you could walk through walls and be <laughs> invisible. Mm -hmm. But I don't think any of her other fiction really goes into that kind of stuff i think it more no. lays on the gothic end of it which i guess and i just thought it was interesting like that the whole the, the 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 gothic angle that i suppose is a part of this but our main character he can do all these things and he in fact goes to his laboratory sometimes and just hangs out there and does research but he's also in prison during this time. Yeah, right. And he doesn't just, like, disappear. He, like, goes, he goes to the prison to, prison to sleep yeah. and do regular prison things. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so weird. Yeah. And, and I just, like, it's got this real heavy lapidary kind of, I am a victim of my fate. But, and I wonder about that. Like, he he's obviously reacting to the fact that Brent tried to essentially, I guess, blackmail him or, like, I know that you have this secret. Like, he tries to implicate him with a diamond, and it's not right, and it's not fair. But the scientist already seems to feel guilty, which, again, makes me wonder about the whole thing with Brent's wife. They clearly know each other, and the way that they're first introduced has something to do with, like, a poisonous thing. Like, has something to do with a... I can't remember exactly how it is, how it goes in the story, but Brent is like almost going to upset something and the scientist warns him and he's like hey don't don't do that that's dangerous right and i feel like brent didn't just visit randomly like they knew each other obviously before and the thing about brent's wife she was poisoned and it makes me think that maybe the scientist was involved with that do you think they think i'm reaching there or is that like is that i just felt like that was it wasn't said outright, but it was implied, like, after their meeting in the story, initially. Our scientist already had a reason, perhaps, to feel guilty when all this started. So it wasn't just like, oh, this man tried to implicate me falsely with this diamond that I stole it from him, when he knows what the truth is, more or less, even, even if he doesn't understand the scientific implications of it. It seemed like there was more to it than that. Yeah, it definitely implies that Brant was involved in the poisoning of his wife. Right, and I thought that I thought that the scientist knew about that, like he was involved in that somehow. Like maybe he supplied, perhaps Brent, being a prestigious judge, gave him money and allowed him to further his researches, and in turn for that, our scientist helped Brent with this mysterious poison that wouldn't be detected in an autopsy that wouldn't be you know what i'm saying yeah no for sure i don't know that 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 was that was a cool subtle implication of the story having more depth behind it i think yeah and again that's something perhaps she could have gone more into but she's packing a lot into this little story and some of it is sort of hidden and not not quite clear so ultimately Although I found the story a little bit, I don't know, it was a little bit hard to keep track of the narrative from time to time. Yeah. Because it glossed over so many really heavy things really quickly and just implied them. This was really good. Yeah. No, I like this one a lot too. Yeah. This was a solid mystery kind of story, but also with very, very heavy gothic overtones. Yeah. And I mean, the gothic stuff really comes out more in the pro style than like the narrative of the right. plot elements. but there's also but, like you know saint angel and yeah the whole like yeah right it, it, it has this kind of like you have your fate 
and you are destined to follow your course and there are beings that are represented by things like purity and corruption like saint angel and brent perhaps starting out as opposites mm -hmm. and then becoming intertwined as a single individual which is a much better individual perhaps right yeah very interesting story very interesting highly recommended i think this was one of the good ones for sure yep i agree all right let's go back to spain all right let's do it all right let's go and spend some time with miguel de unamuno <laughs> 